Welcome back uh, with our um, hopefully last episode of our short in the focused study in the uh, books of the prophets. And as I said, first time, it's more of an outline to understand how we can deal with the uh, big bulk of the Old Testament, which is the prophets. Very quick summary. In the first time, we um, had a division like the, the the parts that make uh, the definition of the word prophets, the eras of the prophecy, um, prophet before Moses, the prophets uh, after Moses, the early prophets, the late prophets, uh, major prophets and minor prophets. We answer all these questions. We give a historical outline of the classification of the prophets uh, in terms of the relationship to the exile. Uh, we described how that there were prophets assigned for the North Kingdom and others for the Southern Kingdom. There were prophets that came before the exile. There were prophets that came um, between the Israel exile and Judea exile. And there were prophets during the uh, Judea exile. And there were prophets that came at the last days after they came uh, from the uh, exile. We also uh, went through a very quick summary of the titles that was given to the prophets and we uh, uh, explain what do they mean, the man of God, the servant of the Lord, uh, the messenger, and we explain other two uh, happy words, the nappy and the seer. Um, then uh, from there, last time, uh, we um, discovered together what it means um, to have, uh, what does it mean like when, when we say, when the Bible use the word, uh, the sons of the prophets or the uh, procession of the prophets or uh, the schools of the prophets and all these terms that we read a lot in the, in the book of Kings and what exactly means. And we explain pretty much what it means in terms of the groups of prophets and their job back then. Um, then, Last time we focused more on understanding what is true versus false prophecy. Uh, we said that the true prophecy are the word of God. And the prophet will always clearly say that this word is put in my mouth through God. He never claims that he is the source of it. And we even gave a lot of examples of those prophets who said that, you know, I had the word of, my, of the Lord in my mouth. If the Lord is like a, a lion roar who can, you know, not talk and so on. So we give a lot of examples and we also give validations or criteria uh, to val uh, validate the, the true prophecy. We said that the true prophecy uh, always um, claims that he's in direct contact with God. He never claims that he has his own words. Um, he always, good example, you know, for people around him. Yes, we see exception about that. Yes, we see sometimes prophets who are doing mistakes uh, or even how deviated from the truth. But at the end of the day, most of them will be like a role model for their people. Um, then we give also another criteria that they're always um, a, a, a gift from God when it, in terms of signs and wonders. We've seen Moses and all the signs that have done with his people, Elijah and Elisha, um, a lot of them uh, we can read in the book of Kings uh, and Samuel, of course. Um, so one more uh, beside performing signs and wonders are that these prophecies are fulfilled, meaning that every single word they will say, God will support them, that it will happen eventually. Uh, we said there is an exception for that if we have a conditional prophecy. And we explain what does it mean when we have a conditional prophecy in terms of that there are prophecies that God will say that will happen if something happened. And we saw that a great example, very well known of Jonah, and then in Evite, how God threatened them, but when they repented, he changed his mind. So that's what's called a conditional prophecy. Um, also, we uh, confirm the idea of how this prophecy has to match other prophecies. It has to go in the same line with previous validation. And there's no way that one prophet will say, will say something while the other prophet will say a contradictory thing. It has to be um, it, going in the same uh, flow. That's what we uh, finished last time. We started another topic, which what is the message uh, of the prophets. We started that, and we give a very short and concise outline in terms of what what is the message of the uh, prophets. 
Uh, we said that there are three main messages for any prophet we uh, read about. Any single uh, book or prophet we can read, we can put three categories for his uh, message. The first message is there was a covenant between God and you, and you broke it. So you better uh, repent. That's the first message. A message of repentance for those who broke God's uh, covenant with its people. Then the second message will be, well, no repentance. Then there will definitely be judgment. And the judgment will come uh, not only on Israel or Judea through exile or anything like that, but it's also going to be throughout the all, the, you know, all the nations. And we've seen a lot of prophets uh, that talk not only on Israel as nation, but also talk about other nations. And that's a very common theme, by the way, in some of the prophets. We've seen that very commonly in Isaiah. Uh, we see that very commonly in uh, Amos. And we will mention uh, at the end today a summary of these uh, prophecies. Um, so covenant, well, you have to repent because you broke it. Um, repent uh, After repentance, if not done, there is judgment that's coming. Then we said, even if there is judgment, beyond this judgment, there is hope. There is what's called the remnants. There is what's called the future, uh, future restoration for Israel and Judah. And, you know, then definitely it's extended for all nations. And I tried last time as much as I can to avoid to be very strict dealing with what's in the prophets and try to relate that to ourselves. For example, when we were talking about the covenant, we said that we have always to understand that our relationship with God is a covenant. It's a commitment that we had when we were born in the baptism, that we are the children of his. We were uh, anointed with the Mayroon that our organs are not ours anymore. And we said that there has to be two dimensions for this covenant. There is a vertical one between us and God, and uh, there is a horizontal one between us and everyone else. And the same way, or the disease or the problems that the uh, Israelites had, we still have the same. We said that the vertical one, uh, there were two big problems. The first problem is that uh, they, um, they have this ritual, um, you know, worship. They only talk, cared about what the cult itself, the performance and the ritual that they're doing without really uh, sticking to the spirit of this worship. And there's another problem is what we described last time as the syncretism, uh, which is, you know, having um, other gods beside God. And we said that we, spiritually speaking, have both problems uh, nowadays. Then uh, that was the, the first idea, which is the covenant, breaking the covenant and the necessity of uh, the spirit of repentance and coming back. Then the second big problem that we're going to elaborate more about today, uh, which is the judgment. When, when the prophets talk about judgment, they always talk two dimensions. One of it is uh, foretelling, talking about the future, and that constitutes a very small, you know, it's more of minority of the word of prophecy, but there is what's called the foretelling, and we have to differentiate. The foretelling is to tell the future. Uh, and have clear, you know, signs of what's going to happen in the future. And the, the, the and a big part of that has to do also with the messianic uh, age, to talk about Christ, the Messiah, how does he look like, and all the prophecies that we are all pretty much very familiar with, uh, because it's repeated uh, either in words or in uh, action in the life of Christ in the Gospels. That's very famous. But unfortunately, that's the only understanding that we have about prophecy. There's a big part of prophecy that I'm here to tell you, you know, it's very important. And actually, it makes a, biggest, bigger, a bigger part of the prophecy, which is a force telling. And force telling is to correct people's life, to exhort them, to instruct them. So it's more of directing people, you know, in the right um, direction. That's, that's very important. That's very common in the theme of um, prophecy. And if that's not going to happen, the, the, the judgment will come. So it's very important for us to that they're not only warning about the judgment, but they're seeing that it will happen. It's eventually there unless if you change your ways. And there were times when it was pretty much kind of too late, even if they're like, you know, change your way. But I, the prophets will say, oh, we see it. You know, we see the judgment on the doors. And they, they talked a lot about that. Um, that's the second theme, uh, which is a judgment. 
talking about the future and like i said the remnant or you know if there even if there will be judgment there will still be uh, hope out there will talk us about a very common theme in uh, that connects between both the judgment and the hope which is something called the day of the lord this word is repeated a lot in, in, in some of the prophets. Like it's, it's every few verses, you will read this expression, the day of the Lord. And I will mention some examples, hopefully, if you have time. But it's judgment and at the same time, future or hope-wise. It's to give this messianic kingdom as the day of the Lord that fulfills both. Because this messianic kingdom the coming of Christ, either the first coming, which happened already, or the second coming for judgment will fulfill both aspects because it will be judgment for those who did not listen, did not repent, and it will be the hope, the restoration, and the life to come for those who uh, repented. So see the first point, which is repentance, will lead to either of the other two options, either judgment, if people did not repent, or um, the hope, the restoration of the life to come in the messianic uh, kingdom or the eternity in our uh, New, New Testament language. In terms of order, the oldest prophecy, when we say that there's a more of a foretelling, the oldest one, and I want you to go to that, and I hope if you guys are writing notes, write down this Genesis 12. Um, and I, I think we can start sharing some reading. Um, because in Genesis 12, um, we, we see how God is talking with um, Abraham. And um, we can see how God is referring um, to the blessing that's coming in Abraham. Uh, and this blessing is clearly has to do with, like I said, the theme of what's coming, the theme of the prophecy. Um, then God says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. This is the oldest in the first prophecy for telling about the coming of the uh, Messiah, because there is a near fulfillment for it, which is that Abraham himself will be the great nation of Israel, and there is a far fulfillment with it for Christ, the Messiah, who will come from his offspring. So, and this will be really the, 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 the blessing for all the nations because take care of something that he, at the end of this prophecy, although that he's saying, I will make you a great nation. So the nation of Israel itself will be a blessing in itself, but it's not only gonna be a blessing for itself only, but it will be a blessing to everyone else. And you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Because people will always think about the fact, okay, you know, he's talking only about Israel. No, he's not only talking about Israel because he says in, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham was not only a blessing for, for Israel or even from Ishmael, like the other, you know, descendants of Ishmael. No, Abraham, in terms of the New Testament understanding, is a blessing for the whole world through Christ because the salvation given in Christ is not only for Israel, it's for the whole world. And here comes the true fulfillment of um, the uh, prophet. I hope I have time at the end to talk about this in detail, the difference between the near view and the far view and how we can, we as Christian look at that nowadays. That's very important, I guess, dealing with um, the prophecy or the fulfillment of the prophecy or the foretelling and the foretelling of the uh, prophecies. Um, so in terms of, like I said, the three accusation that God in prophecy against his people, which is the materialistic uh, worship uh, and worshiping idols and the social injustice. And, you know, that's, that's, these are the three accusations that God has against his people. And that's what made God a lot of times in prophecy attack all the rituals that they have and he was very actually kind of harsh dealing with you know what uh, what they're doing and sometimes and here i'm here also to answer that very clearly 
because a lot of people will take this text and says, okay, see, that's what you guys are still doing in churches. We shouldn't worship in church. We should stop doing that because God said that in Isaiah, for example, uh, one, and I, I will read what God was accusing his people, but see what he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings uh, of rams and of the fat of fat cattle. I do not delight in the, in the blood of bulls or the lambs of, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to tremble my corpse? Bring no more fit, uh, futile sacrifices and senses and abomination to me. So, and even he says that he's not happy with the feast and all these things. I don't want to read the whole thing. And he even says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. And that's really hard. Like that, it's very hard for us to listen to these words nowadays when we practice all the worship that we have. And the answer over here to say, well, we cannot take that just and say, ah, oh, God doesn't want anyone to worship him because it was God who arranged all these things. It was God who ordered Moses to do the tabernacle with all the worship. It was God's order uh, that he have to, you know, um, celebrate this feast and like, you know, appear before the Lord because he says, you know, when you come to appear before me, well, it was God who ordered them to appear three times a year at least. So why is God is so harsh in here? That's something that we have to think about because we have to take that personally as well. When we appear before the Lord, what God will really refuse and what God will really accept? That's a question that we have to ask ourselves every time we go to church, every time we stand up to pray, every time we do anything in life. And the answer is, first off, we have to understand that doing all these things are not from ourselves. It's a gift from God. So even the sacrifice, it was a gift from God. So we have to understand that when we do that, we do that just to have this mutual relationship with God. He given us some things and we come there for him. Even the, the Hebrew word of feast, it means, and it's very clear in Arabic, it's Eid. And in the Hebrew, it's Ma'id. And the Ma'id is like having an appointment. It's like having a date with someone. So in God's mind, all these feasts were not just for celebration. It was for having an appointment with God, is to present before the Lord. But they never did that. They came there like Christ did when he just took them out of the temple, just to like be, you know, merchants, you know, there and they were selling and buying. They were cheating and they were just like doing, you know, all these sins and these celebrations. And then God looked at them like, that's not what I want. You lost the point of all that, what I gave you. And here comes the message of the prophecy uh, to say, you guys lost your track. That's not what God, you know, gave us these things for. So all this ritualization, you know, the system and all this kind of mechanical, you know, idea of doing rituals, like doing it over and over and over, you don't even think about it, is also something that we have to think about nowadays when we do anything. When we want to lecture you, when we stand up to pray Agbeya, when we use any like, you know, reciting words, we have always to take our time to see that. That one was, was the, the biggest problem that God has with them. The other problem also, like we said last time, is the uh, syncretistic practice, meaning to mix, you know, they were doing all these things, but at the same time, they were worshiping idols. And I'm like, God, is, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, jealous God. You cannot worship me and worship others as well. And here comes God is refusing all these things because he said, you know what? If you're going to keep doing all this faithfully, but at the same time, worship other people, here is my message through the prophets that I'm, I'm not accepting that. So that's number two. Number three, definitely, like we said, the, the horizontal one. And Isaiah here, he says that your hands, see, read that with me. Your hands are full of blood. That's hard. Your hands are full of blood. All this, you know, like hatred, all this, like, you know, injustice, all these bad things that you guys are doing, uh, I, that's they're going to make me at the end not accepting any of these uh, worshiping from you. And here comes the prophets to push them hard to the right track, to the, to the place where they really uh, should see uh, God's work in their life. So this is in summary, the message uh, that the prophecy has. Three big message and three accusations. The three big messages are, there is a covenant, you guys broke it, you have to repent. Number two, if you never repented, there is a big problem that you guys are going to face, which is judgment. And judgment and the literal message is exile 
when a spiritual message is the second coming of God, when he judged all the nations, then, you know, if there is judgment, there is hope beyond it, and which is, which is the, the um, you know, the day of the Lord where God will come. For those who never repented, this day of the Lord will be a day of judgment. But for those who loved God and lived with him and repented, it will be the restoration or the, the New Testament church as we see it. And then the heavenly church as well. That's just to summarize the outlines of the uh, messages of the prophets. These are the three. Then the three accusations, like we said, vertically speaking, is to have this, uh, you know, relationship between other gods and at the same time worshiping God. So that's, that's, that's one. Number two, the materialistic uh, worship that they, they just did as a routine. Uh, number three, the problems that they have when, in terms of their relationship with their brothers and sisters and even with the whole world in terms of injustice and like, you know, all this hatred and all these uh, bad practices that they have in their life. So that's in summary, the message of the uh, prophet. Then we have a big topic, hopefully we can cover it now, which is the, uh, the understanding of the fulfillment of the uh, prophets, or what what's the scholars usually call them the fulfillment formulas in the New Testament. The relationship between the Old and the New Testament is something that most of the fathers, if not all of them, talked about them a lot. And that's something that we have to, like, kind of cover um, in, in details. And I think it's it really, we cannot have enough time to do that. But I always love the verse uh, in, the, um, in the book of Revelation. Just to summarize this theme, um, when, when, um, when, Jonah, when, uh, when John was in the book of Revelation, he says that the testimony of Christ is the spirit of the prophets. In other words, that the main idea, the main purpose of the prophecy itself is to present Christ to everyone. That, that's, if you wanna just summarize the whole idea, not only in terms of foretelling about him with all the prophecies that we're gonna cover in the next few minutes, but it's the whole idea of salvation, how God, since the story of the, the, the fall, he offered this to his people. At the moment of the fall, he said that, you know, I'm preparing this uh, way. And he started, like we saw in Genesis 12, this blessing, even from, uh, from the person of Abraham and nation of Israel, and definitely uh, throughout the whole journey of the kingdom of Israel. So it's, we have always to understand whenever we read any, you know, you know, any prophecy, we have to look for Christ in it. Otherwise, it will lose its track. It's just going to be uh, more of history, you know, and not really a, um, a, a prophecy in what we can uh, understand. It. I, I'm not going to cover that in details because it's huge, of course, to fulfill all the quotes that we can read from the Old Testament. I will just give examples and put them in categories for the ease of study as well. Um, there is what's called the direct fulfillment, meaning that you say something and you find it right away. And that's very common. And we read that especially in the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew was written for Hebrew for those who knew the Old Testament. So all his book um, has direct relationship with what's written in the Old Testament. There is dozens of prophecy uh, we can read, especially, like I said, in the book of Matthew. And there is also... Um, not few in uh, Gospel of John. Uh, for example for it are a lot, um, you know, one of it, for example, is the prophecy that we all know in Isaiah 7, 14, that, you know, um, that the virgin will be, will, will be with child and will give birth to a son and he will be called Emmanuel, you know, and that was fulfilled in, uh, in Matthew 122, when he says, you know, that, you know, the virgin will be with a uh, child and will give birth to a son and will be called Emmanuel. That's, that's very, um, very clear uh, in the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 7, for, uh, 14. There is also another one and a great one of fulfillment. Um, that's 
called the uh, prophecies of the servant. I don't know if you ever heard that, but it's a great, uh, a very famous example is Isaiah 53. And we all know that. That's read in the, in the, new, in the uh, Holy Week and in details. Uh, we 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 dis, we studied that in the uh, Holy Week when we give the study of the prophecies of the Old Testament that has to do with the Holy Week. Um, but reading this chapter, and it's not only this chapter, but what's before and what's after, uh, is very strong uh, fulfilled in Christ. And there is a big discussion, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cover it because it needs a lot of time. Uh, we. When we talk with, with you know, Jewish people nowadays, they say that you guys are making it up. Like, you know, none of these prophecies are directed to the Messiah. When you read the context of it, it's, it's referring very clearly to the nation of Israel. Because there are seven, there are seven uh, prophecies in Isaiah that's talking about the servant, the servant that we can read uh, about here who has believed our report and to whom has the arm uh, of the Lord been revealed. And again, like I said, I, I can't read that. It's a very, a very long one. But he says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was burst, uh, bruised for our iniquities. Uh, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And I can't read the whole thing. It's really nice to read it. I love it so much. But when when you talk with Jewish people, say that's that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the servant and the servants in other uh, prophecies in Isaiah as well. It's talking about the nation of Israel. And here comes the idea that I want to deliver to you today. The New Testament never look at the Old Testament as only a direct fulfillment, but it has new dimension. It has different layers. Meaning that referring at these servant prophecies at the Messiah is not against referring to other people. Let me give you another example. When he says, out of Egypt, I called my son. We can look at this prophecy at two levels. One of it is to say that the nation of Israel was taken out of slavery from Egypt by the grace of God. God took them. He called them out of Egypt. This is a level. But when we look at the, you know, the Jesus a child with Mary and Joseph escaping from Herod to Egypt, we see a second layer of this fulfillment. So what I want to say here is that this fulfillment doesn't contradict with the direct uh, reference of this prophecy. And that's very clear in the prophecy of the servants, like I said. That might be a separate topic that can be discussed in detail all the prophecies of the servant, which are seven, by the way. And a lot of them refer directly and say, this is the nation of Israel. But like I said, when you read all these things, in their understanding, the Jewish nowadays, they're talking about how the Jewish nation suffered a lot. And through its suffering, you know, it will be a blessing for the world. And I always tell them, where on earth you guys were considering yourself as a blessing for the world? There is no preaching even. There is no asking of anyone to join this salvation. And so at the end of the chapter, he was talking about how he was making intercession for the transgressors. Where in the Jewish understanding where the nation of Israel making intercession for transgression, where that it says that it bore the sin of many, would they really say that they bore the sin of, you know, Nazis because they killed them because that's how they interpreted the servant that they were suffering of the persecution well but you guys never interceded for us you guys never the bore, bore the sense of others though it's a long discussion but I wanted to refer at it here when we're talking about this fulfillment prophecy to say that yes there is a direct layer a direct you know reference to the prophecy but there's always a second layer of it referring to the New Testament, sir, and I see it as a complete fulfillment for it as well. That's the fulfillment. There is another type that's called the citation, meaning that we're not referring to a verse specifically that was repeated again in the New Testament, but we were more of referring to a, um, a, a, 
a relationship. It's they call it more of you know event lived and relived. One very famous example, for example, is the story of um, the killing of the children of Bethlehem. When you read about that in Jeremiah, it says a voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. In the context that you read it, it's very clear that it's talking about the exile and the Babylonian captivity that will happen eventually. That's very clear. But when you read in the New Testament and I see how the exactly the same thing that in Ephrata, Bethlehem, where Rachel was, there was a voice of weeping because all their children was killed. So when you read uh, Jeremiah 31, the prophecy, and Matthew 2, to connect them, that's an example of what's called the formula of citation, meaning that there is an experience that happened and it will be relived again uh, through the generations that, uh, that will follow. So that's in very short summary, uh, what's called the fulfillment, you know, uh, of the text and there is the, the citation. The third e example of uh, the relationship between all the prophecies, Old Testament prophecies and New Testament is the typology. Typology is very clear to allegory, even that scholars try to make difference, but we're not here in, a, in an academic study, so we can put them in one package more or less. Typology or allegory is more of reference to symbolism. Things that you know you can interpret it in a different way uh, when you look at it in the New Testament. And again, we know a lot of these. Um, we'll give you an example. For example, the um, the what should I say? Yeah, for example, for example, the uh, servant, the bronze servant, right? It's very clear in the bronze servant. Jesus said the same thing. Like you know, exactly, he said the same way like Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness same way that the son of man would be raised. This is a clear typology. And it's not us who made this up, this typology. Christ himself started it. Like I said, he was talking about the bronze serpent. He was talking about how he is, he is Jonah. Because when he said, are you looking for a sign? Well, the sign is the same way like Jonah was, was buried for three days and nights. The son of man also would be buried uh, three days and nights. Then the church lived this experience over and over. And definitely the most skilled one of dealing with that is St. Paul. In the first Corinthians 10, we see this fulfillment of typology. And St. Paul put it as a, as a theme for the, for the Old Testament, as if the Old Testament only were, was only made for this reason. Look what he says in, in the first Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be un unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. When you read that, you feel like he gave no space for typology or symbolism or allegory. He just put it clearly. He doesn't say that they were as if they were baptized in the, in the Red Sea. No, he says that they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So you can take these words and in the New Testament language, we are all baptized into Christ in the baptism basin. See how it's, 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 then he continues because he, he make it a scene. He says, and all ate the same spiritual food. Like they all ate communion. We all ate communion, right? And all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So St. Paul is very skillful because he's a Pharisee. He, he knows these things by heart. He studied them. He, for years, and he know all these things. Then he concludes, and I want you to memorize this verse, because I think if you only ended up with this verse uh, from the whole study, I'll be happy. He says, now these things became our examples. That's it. You can just memorize it. Now these things became our examples. And he continued giving instructions, you know, do not become idolaters, as were some of them. Right? Do not commit sexual immor immorality as some of them. Do not uh, let us tempt, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them, nor complain as some of them. Then he concluded with a very great, uh, like, you know, um, slogan. He says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition 
upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That summarizes the whole purpose of prophecy. Like I said, it from one aspect, clearly referring to Christ and in the fulfillment in us, like he says here, it happened to them as examples as they were written for our admonition. So that's that's covers not only typology that we're talking about now, but it covers the whole you know vision that we can look at the uh, Old Testament. That's very important uh, to see that. There is a lot of talking about like, you know, there is a lot of examples. I mean, again, if you're writing notes, I'll give you a few and you guys study them uh, by your own. A lot of them actually. Um, there is, for example, the two spies uh, in the promised land, you know, and how that's co connected to the church of the Old Testament and the New Testament, how they led to salvation. You cannot li live only with one of them. There is an extreme allegory. Sometimes the early father went in a very extreme. And I'll give you an example that when I, when I read, I was like, wow, that's so far. But I will just give you an example how the church, especially the church of Alexandria, by the way, was very extreme in dealing with everything in the Bible, looking at it and uh, allegorical uh, you know, view. St. John Chrysostom, when he was talking about this incident of slaughtering the infants in Bethlehem at the time of the birth of Christ, he says, and I'm quoting uh, St. John uh, uh, Chrysostom, the fact that only the children of two years old and under were murdered while those of, those of, of three reasonably escaped. He says like, why two years and, you know, and under were killed and anyone more than two years were not. He says, it means to teach us that those who hold the Trinitarian faith will be saved. Whereas by a bind Trinitarian or uni Trinitarian will undoubtedly perish. So what he wanna say is because anyone doesn't believe in Trinity will perish. That's why anyone has you no know, less than three years, two years and, and less will die. That's an extreme you know, allegory. And that's why there was a big conflict because, between the Church of Alexandria and the Church of Antioch at this time. The Church of Antioch looked at the Church of Alexandria like, you guys are taking it out of, you know, so extreme. It's just a literal word you guys have to deal with. Not to, they never were against contemplation, but they were against this very, you know, kind of uh, strong form of allegorism. Although St. John Chrysostom is not from Alexandria, he actually was raised in Antioch. But my point here is there were only argument about how far we can go with this allegory because it really went a lot uh, in, in an extreme. But it gave us a space that the word of God is not only as we see. So I promise that I'll give some examples. We said the two spots. Then there was the uh, incidents where Moses were praying and he's raising his hand at the time of the battle with the Amalekites. There is Rahab's uh, red scarlet cord that she, um, you know, make the spies escape through it. There is, like I said, the bronze serpent. There's a lot. This is just a short list of things uh, that, you know, are examples of the prophecy that was fulfilled through typology and allegory and so on. Uh, to summarize this point, there is different level of dealing with the scripture. And the father were different about how many levels should we have. Some people were talking about two levels literal and spiritual that's it so you can look at the text and deal with it literally we're talking about judgment exile here you go history a lot straightforward then there's another spiritual level looking at it in the eyes of the new testament while we don't repent there will be judgment and the judgment is a bondage of, of the uh, you know of, of uh of devil and this devil will you know took us into slavery and there's no freedom in christ and so on this is a spiritual. I'm just giving you an example. So this is two level. Origin believed in three levels. He was teaching these three levels. Literal, moral, and spiritual. So he added this moral, meaning that, for example, if, if in the example that I, I, uh, I mentioned, like, you know, uh, ex exile. Exile is history, happen. Then spiritual, like I said, the New Testament vision of the devil uh, enslaving a human, there is a moral one in between 
where you can say, you know what, if you're going to be like, you know, like live in a bad uh, moral life, you will be like, you know, uh, slave to habits and your, you know, your behavior will be bad and you're going to be morally, you know, corruptible and so on. So Arjun put a third or, or a second uh, in between the literal and the allegorical or the spiritual, something called the moral aspect. Then the father added more also a fourth layer of meaning that that makes it so hard though. Uh, but I'm just wanna give you an example of how the fathers went so far in dealing with these levels of interpreting the word of God. Like I said, the church uh, of Alexandria was pioneer in dealing with these levels of spiritual and the, 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 the interpretation always took an extreme but my message for you here, just to have a spiritual message dealing with the Old Testament, is to have this alphabet dealing with this. Like, for example, if we're talking about, you know, uh, bad behavior, change it into your own sin. If you're talking about, like, exile, change it into bondage of a sin. If you're talking about, you know, worship, sacrifices, change it into your own sacrifice that you can offer. If you're talking, if you're seeing, you know, and so on, if you're seeing like, you know, people who are morally incorruptible and like, you know, they're, they're never literally living uh, like good life, change that into how we can live a Christian life surrounding us through the word of, uh, you know, uh, exhortation in the, um, in the uh, word of uh, the prophecy. So this is more of a summary between the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And like I said, there will be always more than one level that we can deal with. There will be always um, a, a space for more than just one interpretation. That's why we always have to look for this interpretation. That's why we have to uh, kind of doing a lot of, um, if I can say a lot of homework, a lot of work, a lot of studies when we read the word of God, because it's very important for us to look for these dimensions in our reading in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament. So I encourage you uh, to have this uh, view of looking at the word of God as a ma personal message, as a fulfillment of uh, the Messianic vision. The last thing I will conclude, so we'll have a very, very, very uh, two words about each one of the prophets. I know it will be kind of dry, but if someone is writing notes again, it will be nice to have a summary for every one of these prophets. I will take exactly 10 minutes, hopefully not more, where we were just pointing at each one of them very briefly, just like a summary, like a capsule where we can just have a title on our mind. And I will take them more or less historically speaking. Before the exile, we said that there are, there are you know, many prophets. Uh, there is Jonah, there is Joel, there is Amos, there is Hosea. There's Isaiah and Michael. So th they're, they're summarizing them as six before the exile. Jonah has a very famous story. We all know him. He was sent to Nineveh that they repent. So the summary of this book is that God for all, because he sent this message for everyone. So if you want to summarize it in only one or two, three words, God for all. So he was sent to, to uh, you know, uh, Gentile, to two nations, so they can repent, so God is for all. Joel has a very famous scene that we were talking about, which is the, you know, the day, you know, God's day. Because he was always talking about how we can change, you know, our hearts. He was talking about this, uh, you know, um, plague, locusts that will come and eat. So he was always talking about the day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment and it's a day of, you know, um, mercy for those who lived with him. So if you want to put only two words for Joel, it's God's day. God's day. Amos. Amos were only talk, were always talking about group sins. You know, like those, he put them in groups and how people like, you know, that, and he's the, the most famous one who was talking about social, you know, injustice. And he was never politically correct. Like he was, he would describe them very, very harsh. You would like look at the, you know, he says like, uh, you look like the cows of Bashan, like very obese because you're eating so much. You don't care about the poor and so on. So 
if you wanna if you wanna put one word for for uh, for Amos, it's avenge. Just avenge, and it was mentioned in chapter five. Avenge. Number three, there is Hosea, and you know how Hosea started, but God asked him uh, Hosea um, that he take you know harlot you know as a wife. Some people says no, he asked him to take uh, his wife who cheated on him, and he wanted to bring her back. Anyway, but he allowed him to have, you know, um, the marriage with uh, with a harlot wife, and what God want to say here that He want us back, you know, even if we're sinner. So it, you can say that that in chapter six He says, "Let's come back to the Lord." So Hosea, short message: Let's come back to the Lord. Isaiah, in the same era of before the exile, he was talking about God the Holy, the Messiah the servant, the suffering servant, and also they even call him the fifth gospel. If you want to put one or two words, you can say the Holy Savior. Again, the Holy Savior. Because uh, he looked at the holiness of God throughout all these things that we mentioned and we didn't have a chance to mention, and he's looking at him as a Savior. So the Holy Savior, Isaiah title is the Holy Savior. Number six, before the exile is Micah. And Micah has a lot of messianic prophecies as well. But if you want to put it in one word that was repeated, that was mentioned in chapter seven, he says, who is like you, a forgiver. So he's looking at God as a forgiver. So as one sentence, just one phrase, who is like you, a forgiver, that was mentioned in chapter seven. So Micah, God, the forgiver. Isaiah, the Holy Savior. Hosea, Let's come back to the Lord. Amos, God, you know, avenge. Joel, God's day. And Jonah definitely is God for all. Between Israel and Judea exile, we will have um, one, two, three, four, five. Five prophets. Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Baruch. They're so, they're contemporary. They always mention together. And Habakkuk. So there's five, Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and the two that's contemporary, which is Jeremiah and Baruch. Nahum was always um, prophesying against nations, especially Nineveh. So the title can be the end of evil. And he mentioned in the first chapter, end of evil. God is, you know, is, will condemn this nation, especially Nineveh. Um, and that's definitely looked like how the nation of Nineveh, even though they repented in, in Jonah's time, they went back to their sin. So end of evil. Zephaniah, um, he was warning people how the exile, the Judea exile is coming. He was like telling them, look at your brothers in Israel. They were exiled and you guys going to have the same fate. And they were always saying, ah, you know, we have the temple. We will never have this problem. We are, the, you know, we have this sacrifice and so on. So his uh, theme was the zealous God. God is the, has zeal, you know, he's, he's a zeal, you know, zealous God. He, like, he cannot allow sin, even if you are his nation, even if you have the sacrifices, even if you have the temple, God is, you know, zealous. He can't he can let you live this life. Jeremiah is confirming that the exile is coming. He's like, I see it, you know. So he was asking them always um, to, to be you know, to be scared of what's coming. But at the same time, Jeremiah is a very tender heart. We, they call him the weeping prophet. When you talk about him, there's a very personalized thing. You can, you can, you can like kind of hear his, you know, freezing in there. Like he's, he's you can hear his, you know, weeping, tears. And so you can summarize him and in, 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 in what's like, can be summarized like God's avenge, but with kindness. So, so Jeremiah, God's avenge, but with kindness. Baruch, Baruch traveled already to the exile to support people. So he was telling them to hold fast. You know, he was asking them to hold fast your, your faith, hold fast your faith. That's Baruch. And, and, and here, finally, in this category, Habakkuk, he, was, he has questions about, um, you know, Babylon and their, uh, their repentance. So you can put a title that he speaks with God. He always keep asking God questions. So Habakkuk, is asking a lot of questions so you can put him as speak with God in terms of exile and the Babylonians and so on. During the exile, we have two big names, Daniel and Ezekiel. We know both of them. 
Daniel was testifying for the king, right? Through his wisdom, through his behavior and how he was doing great, even in exile. So it's not an excuse that they were in exile, no. So he, you can think about him as condemning darkness, but by light. He never sat there and says, ah, this is our destiny. We ended up in exile. We're bad people. No, he was testifying, have a good testimony for God through his behavior. So you can make a title that, you know, how you condemn darkness by light. Then we have Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel, if, if you want to put one word to uh, look at Ezekiel, I, I love to only think about the word new, new. Ezekiel was thinking about a new temple, a new uh, glory, a new um, city. Everything is new. Everything is new. New. So if you want to put one word for Ezekiel, that there's hope that there will be new everything, new messianic temple and so on. After they came back, there are four uh, big uh, characters. Haggai, Zechariah, Obadiah, and Malachi definitely is the last one. Haggai was encouraging, you know, heart building beside uh, building the temple. Like you guys are caring about the temple, you also have to change from inside. So if you want to put a title, you can put build internal house. Not only the external temple, build internal house. Uh, Zechariah has a lot of prophecies, very, very visionary book. You can see a lot of prophecies in there. And again, because he was talking about rebuilding the temple, uh, he was wanted to tell them God is zealous again. Uh, we saw the same view, uh, God zealous with Zephaniah. Zechariah has the same title, more or less, because he was rebuilding the temple and so on. Obadiah was talking about uh, the nations uh, after the exile, which is Adum, and how they have this bride. They would look at Israelites, look what happened to you, your God didn't help you, and so on. Uh, so he was looking at the avenge for uh, Adum with their bride, and he was telling them, you know, you have what you made. That's a fruit of what you did. Finally, Malachi, the last one, because he was talking about Jesus coming after Elijah. So you can say that there is a way, you know, of God's love to humanity. That God will be back for us through, the, through uh, Elijah, which is John the Baptist, and how this can be fulfilled uh, as, as a messenger. Like we know, St. John the Baptist was a messenger of the voice before the coming of the Messiah. That was a very short study um, overview of the prophets. And today we have a very short summary as well of understanding the uh, layers of interpreting the, the Bible and the prophecies in the Old Testament, generally speaking. Then we concluded with this short message about each uh, prophet. Um, if anyone have any questions or comments, uh, we have a couple of minutes.